So an HHT center is, a, is basically made up of a team of doctors and other healthcare professionals that are providing all of the expertise needed to care for the dis different aspects of HHT. And that's usually quite a lot of people, given that HHT can affect so many different organs and in so many different ways um, and through you know, through the entire lifetime, this means that we need a, a very um, extensive team. So the team typically includes HHT doctors and a nurse coordinator, um, both for adult care and for pediatric care. And these people see, these are sort of the frontline people that see all the patients and manage the all the aspects of HHT and coordinate consultation with the other team members or the, the, the other specialists when they need them. And the other team members include um, medical specialists and also allied health professionals, so non-MD uh, health professionals. So of the medical specialists, specialists, you can see it's quite a long list and it has to do with basically everyone we need to look after all the different aspects of HHT. So, so um, you know, ear, nose and throat physicians, gastroenterologists, interventional radiologists to treat lung AVMs, respirologists to diagnose and follow lung AVMs, hematologists to manage um, complicated anemia, um, brain AVM experts, uh, which is usually a multidisciplinary team in itself of surgeons and neurointerventional radiologists like Dr. Krings and radiation specialists, neurologists to manage migraines, cardiologists to manage heart failure, hepatologists, pulmonary hypertension specialists, dermatologists to treat bleeding um, uh, mouth and, and, and skin lesions, diagnostic radiologists. So quite a long list, as you can see. And most people in our HHT clinic, by the way, don't need to see all these people. Most people in an HHT center will see the HHT doctor and the nurse coordinator, um, and when needed, might be interacting with some of these other team members. There are also a number of allied health professionals that can really contribute in an HHT center. For example, a genetic counselor, um, and you've heard us talk several times about, about using genetic diagnostics to have, help um, sort out family members. Um, pharmacists, um, given some of the medic types of medications we've described that some of our patients need. Um, dietitians to help advise people on how to get more iron in the diet, for example. Um, social workers when, when there are issues about drug funding. Um, respiratory care practitioners often helpful in the testing of our pulmonary, of our lung AVM patients. So, so quite an extensive team um, that we call on um, in an HHT center. Where do we have HHT centers and clinics across Canada? So we have, uh, we have six um, and obviously it's not enough, but this is already um, a step forward from 10 years ago when we were, we had about half that many. Um, but we definitely, as you can see, there are some areas of Canada that are really not, uh, where there are long distances between centers or where there's no centers, for example, on the East Coast. Um, so the, um, we have a center in Toronto. You, uh, Scott Apperly is here from the Vancouver HHT Center and Charlene Fell from the Calgary HHT Clinic. Um, we also have a center in Montreal, in Winnipeg, and in Edmonton, and you've heard from some of those speakers um, today and at, and at the last HHT conference. Um, I've got a little asterisk beside those centers that are officially accredited by the uh, Cure HHT. Um, the International HHT Foundation is HHT Centers of Excellence, and um, and so you know this is um, and this is something that uh, um, that you know we would like to we would like to encourage not only more centers across Canada, but also encourage centers to be part of this larger organization um, of HHT centers as well, um, given the uh, continuing medical education for centers and being part of the international and North American community. So even though um, not all of our centers are accredited yet by, by Cure HHT, um, they're already quite well connected with Cure HHT and with the other center directors across Canada, and we hope that new centers will be able to, uh, across Canada and the US, and we hope that new centers will be able to do that as well. So what can you do about your HHT in 2021? So first, you need to get diagnosed and your family diagnosed if that isn't already, if that hasn't already happened. And then when once one person is diagnosed in the family, the family needs to use genetic testing to sort out the other people in the family, particularly those who, who don't clearly have HHT. Everyone who clearly has HHT or who seems to have HHT who has symptoms of HHT should get into an HHT center um, and get screened first as one of the very first steps, get screened for lung and brain AVMs. There's low risk testing for these and we have 
excellent preventative management for lung AVMs and a case-by-case -case, um, expert management of brain AVMs. When you consult with an HHT ex center of excellence, you're gonna be looking for that expertise and getting that expertise that you need to prevent complications. Um, as I've just said, through screening and treatment of lung and brain AVMs, and also to treat the chronic bleeding and other symptoms with HHT. Another really important piece, and some questions have come up around this is, is as an HHT patient, you're, um, we're gonna ask you to share in, the, uh, in our ongoing work of educating your healthcare professionals about your HHT. Um, so you need to educate all the people that look after you about your HHT. Uh, and we're trying to do that from our end as well, but it really requires a team effort, I think, to be effective and to know that our patients are going to be safe in the hands of all healthcare professionals. We, we've actually done something in the last few years um, consistently at the Toronto HHT Centre that, that I just wanted to share with the group because I think this has been a tool that's been, that we've really um, been relying on to help educate other health prof healthcare professionals. And I just added this to the talk after one of the questions during the, uh, no the nosebleed talk, someone was asking about what do you do about educating an emergency room physician? So this, we made this HHT wallet card and this, this picture here is, this is the front of the card and this is the back of the card and it folds up and it goes in your wallet. Um, and when we see someone in the clinic, we fill this out for them. So this is filled out by the, one of our HHT team doctors. And, uh, and we put the person's name, we say they have HHT and we've got both names of the disorder. We have the clinic information. We have some good websites about HHT. Um, and we have, um, and, and on the back of it, we have um, this person's sort of HHT report card and what precautions need to be taken. So epistaxis or nosebleeds, um, you know, if, if basically we say to the patient, show this to any, any doctor you see, or if you go to the emergency room with a bad nosebleed, pull out this card. So when you go to the emergency room with a bad nosebleed and you pull out this card and show it to the doctor, it says that if you come here, every, you know, it's going to say epistaxis, yes, because I'll have filled this out for you, let's say. And it says avoid putting tubes in the nose or traumatizing the nose. And if you're going to pack the nose, use something um, atraumatic, like a dissolvable packing, or even better, currently liquid packing. Um, the least traumatic packing that we have available. Um, so what we find is that even sometimes the emergency docs don't know what to do with that information, but they'll call us because they have, this is like an invitation to reach out to us. So the card goes on, I won't go through all the details of it, but it describes each aspect of HHT and we write, you know, yes or no beside each one. And if, for example, someone has lung AVMs, we tick that off and we tick off the routine precautions related to lung AVMs. So that um, when some, I saw there was a question in the chat about re recommending uh, antibiotics before dental work. Yes, for all patients with lung AVMs treated or not, we recommend antibiotic prophylaxis or antibiotics before dental work, an IV air filter, um, et cetera. And then the, these are the remaining the organ um, where, where we'll, for each one we've assessed and we'll say yes or no and what the precautions are. So this is a tool that we're trying to use to really help people educate their, their healthcare workers about their HHT and to also connect us up with them. There's also, I'm gonna show you in the guidelines talk after this one, I'm gonna show you the HHT care lists, uh, care checklists that have been uh, developed by HHT, uh, by Cure HHT um, and, and our HHT guidelines group. And then what else can you do about your HHT in 2021? Participate or support research if you can to help move HHT care forward. Join HHT Canada in advocating for Canadians with HHT and, and, and join HHT Canada in their mission to support HHT research and education in Canada. This is a very special thing that you have this patient advocacy group. And I think that um, it's, a, it's a, an, an, a good an amazing opportunity for Canadians with HHT to work with the HHT Canada team. So just briefly, what research studies are there? If people asked about how to participate in research, many of the centers have clinical, and you heard about some registry research projects and basic research projects. So ask at your center about these and about how you could help or support them. If you go to clinicaltrials.gov as well, um, which is, um, uh, uh, it's, which is an up-to-date registry of all clinical trials that are currently recruiting patients and you look for HHT studies in Canada, this is, this is what you'll find. There's some clinical trials for nosebleeds and HHT um, to, um, that we're running out of Toronto, the doxycycline trial and the low-dose tacrolimus trial. There's the vitamin D trial that you heard about from Dr. Yavera. 
And then there's soon to be an, a second um, pazopinib clinical trial, um, which has recently obtained funding through the US Department of Defense and under Dr. Gossage. Um, and, but there will likely be Canadian sites recruiting for this as well. We've also got RHHT registry, um, which is um, now we launched it at the Toronto Center. So it was designed by CareHHT, but we launched it at the Toronto Center with the generous, uh, some generous donations from a patient and their family. Um, and, um, and now that we've launched it, there are other centers that have joined it from the US and is now open to all centers across North America to join the registry. So this may be something that you can join and be part of an, a North American wide registry of HHT patients. And finally, we also have the Brain, v, uh, Brain VM registry um, that's been uh, funded by NIH for the last 10 years and that is ongoing. Um, so all of these are, are ways that you can participate in research presently, but it's, it's a moving target. There's a lot going on. And so keep asking the people that are looking after you about what you could participate in. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there um, and I'm going to open up the panel uh, for questions. So I think it would be really good if we, you know, if people have questions, especially about how to access HHT care in Canada, or what if people have concerns about what's available or not available, we'd be happy to try and answer those. But I, but I think we have time too that we can answer also some general questions if they weren't um, answered in other sessions. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Fanin. Uh, we have a couple questions here, um, and we're slowly going to. Um, there's going to be more coming along and we'll bring those up as they come. To start things off, we had a question about uh, dental cleanings. Uh, do you recommend antibiotics before dental cleanings? So uh, I'll, I'll take this one first and then we'll, we'll take turns amongst the three of us. Um, so yes, so we recommend that people that have um, lung AVMs, even if they're treated, get antibiotics before any dental work or even a cleaning. It's not, it's not for everyone with HHT, it's for people with HHT that have lung AVMs or people with HHT that have not been screened for lung AVMs, given that lung AVMs are present in at least 40% of people with HHT. If, if someone hasn't had their screening yet, then, or their screening is out of date, meaning more than five years ago, then they should get antibiotics for any dental work or cleaning. All right, thank you so much. Uh, another question, uh, there's a couple questions surrounding um, how you can get involved with the clinical trials. So do you have to live in the city where the trials are um, currently taking place? And are, for example, is the, the vitamin D study in Vancouver restricted to only patients in Vancouver? Or can someone in Toronto also take part in that study? Scott, do you want to take that one? Yeah, absolutely. I, I wonder if Dr. Javert is still on or not. I think um, part of doing these studies and doing them uh, well, to try to contribute to um, ongoing HHT research and care is, is uh, uh, with some of these is in-person attendance. And so I think uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that there's a restriction on the basis of geography, but it would be something whereby it would be feasible for that individual to um, attend Dr. Javert's clinic. And I don't know if he's still on or not, but if he is, he might be able to to comment further on that. So I don't think it's geography restricted aside from it being logistical. And I would say the same um, in terms of the trials that we have running in Toronto. So we can have out of province people even registered um, or recruited to the clinical trials, but they do require in-person visits um, so that we can assess the effect of the, of the medication we're trialing and also the safety of it. Now we've definitely in COVID times changed some in-person visits to virtual visits, but there are still in-person visits that are necessary for, for those reasons. So I, I totally agree, Scott. It's not so much that we've restricted that, it's that, it's that it's, it can be a little bit too challenging sometimes for people if they're too far away. Great, thank you so much. Another question um, about clinical trials as well. Uh, do, you, do you all traditionally uh, reach out to your patients who would like to be involved or should the patients reach out to you directly to, to ask to get involved? You know what, it happens both ways and both ways are okay. Um, we, um, we don't always have an easy capacity to reach out to people that are not, um, that we haven't heard from recently. That isn't always like 
it, it logistically possible for us, but people that are coming to clinic, we'll often talk to them about the study if we think they would be eligible, but we're very open to having people contact us and say, hey, could I be part of this trial? Absolutely, absolutely. Great, thanks so much. Um, another question. Uh, what is the opinion on someone with HHT nosebleeds having cosmetic surgery on their nose? <laughs> Charlene, do you want to take that one? <laughs> that is a great question. So um, I'll, I'll give you some basic guidelines. And then I think that the most important thing for anyone considering a cosmetic procedure on the nose is, of course, to speak to your HHT clinical team, especially your physician, and then also to sp speak to the plastic surgeon to make sure that they know what HHT is all about, because that's not always the case. So um, I would uh, not proceed with surgery that involves the inside of the nose of the nares, where those um, telangiectasias or their abnormal blood vessels can uh, be prone to bleed. If you were going to be doing something external, it might be a little bit um, safer, but again, you need to go through the procedure, what it entails um, very carefully with your plastic surgeon. And then for sure, the plastic surgeon and the HHT doctor need to be in close communication to make sure that it is actually safe for you to have that procedure. I don't know, Marie, if you've ever come across that in your practice, I certainly haven't. You know, I, I agree with everything you said, Charlene, and I, I, um, I would say this absolutely the same. And I think where it's come up um, for us even more often has been people needing nasal surgery for other reasons, like um, a deviated septum, for example. Um, and and sometimes those sometimes people with a deviated septum have nosebleeds, and so some uh, you know uh, community ENT physicians are very used to doing surgery septoplasty and saying, no problem, your nosebleeds will probably get better with this. But in our HHD patients, it might actually make their nosebleeds worse. It's, it's actually a little bit, a, quite an expert question to figure out whether or not it's a, a good thing for them to do or not. And so in that case, we'll, we'll often say, look, if you're gonna have nasal surgery and you have HHD and nosebleeds, then you should see an HHT nose surgeon about doing that surgery, because then they will be able to better weigh the, you know, what impact that surgery is going to have on your HHT bleeding. That's, that's the only other part that, that I would add, you know, um, yeah, and that, I guess that does come make up. The, point, um, mm -hmm. uh, the, the folks who do the nasal surgery are the ear, nose and throat doctors, the otolaryngologists. And so often they will have a level of experience with HHT and especially those that partner with us and our HHT centers have a lot mm -hmm. of experience. The people who do cosmetic procedures are plastic surgeons. They're not the same kind of surgeon. And so they might not have the same level of expertise or comfort with HHT. So again, that point to get your two teams talking to each other to make sure that it's safe. Totally agree too. All right, so <clears throat> another question. This one's about cannabis. Uh, is there any data or are there any studies surrounding cannabis and its association with HHT? Scott, do you want to take that one? I'm happy to, although it'll be a, a bit of a short answer. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware of um, any uh, studies specifically linking cannabis with, with HHT or... or mm -hmm. Uh, as a respirologist, as we all are, we all we all think of other potential effects of inhalational um, of anything we inhale in our lungs. But um, I, I have a hard time linking it straight to HHT. If anyone else has other comments, yeah, I agree, Scott. Like I, I I don't know of any link. First of all, I don't have any any clear reason to be concerned about cannabis use in HHT patients, um, like related to HHT symptoms or complications. But I agree with you that the, I do worry a bit about, um, you know, about, for example, smoking um, and smoking in general and also smoking pot. Um, and I worry about the irritant effect on the nose in particular and how that might exacerbate nosebleeds. Um, and sort of reduce the sort of nasal health. So it's, you know, in that sense, I think it could have an impact. Um, 
but otherwise in terms of the actual kind of medicinal properties of cannabis, I, I have no particular concerns, but there certainly isn't any evidence one way or the other, but I, I don't have a logical reason to be concerned. Would you agree, Charlene? Yeah, I completely agree. And um, also as a respirologist, my patients coming and asking about uh, cannabis for all kinds of symptoms. And so in general, mm -hmm. we're recommending a oral or edible or topical product as right. opposed to a smoked product, just so that um, you're not inhaling the smoke for all those reasons that mm -hmm. uh, Scott and Marie were mentioning. Great, totally agree, thanks. This is, this is not particularly nice when there are questions like this where we don't have evidence to be able to comment, all three of us. So thanks, mm -hmm. thanks to both of you. Um, I don't know if this kind of changes things or clarifies things, but um, there was a follow-up to that. Uh, so you mentioned a bit about smoking. What about THC in general and products with containing THC? That's what I'm saying. We don't really have any evidence or any, any clear reason to say that it's a bigger problem for HHT patients than other people. Okay, okay. So um, there's, here's another question about AVMs. Do AVMs stop growing with age or do they slow after, for example, 55 years of age, for example? <laughs> well, well this, that's, a, that's a big question because it really depends on what part of the body you're talking about. So um, each organ has seems to have its own sort of natural history from what we know so far. And there's still a lot more to know. Like for example, the brain vascular malformation study I said that we've been doing for 10 years is about understanding natural history of, of brain AVM. So there's, there's a lot we don't know, but what we, but I could try to kind of summarize what we know by organ. Um, so it seems that brain AVMs develop, are, people are either born with them or they develop maybe late in the teen years. It's very, very, very unusual to see brain AVMs develop like new ones or grow in adults. Um, lung AVMs we think probably are mostly present, we think, these are here that I'm saying we think, uh, are probably mostly present at birth and grow over a lifetime, but grow mostly during childhood and pregnancy and not, and, and very slowly after that when, when, when they do. Um, Telangiectasia on the skin, in the nose, um, in the mouth, those can develop at any time in life. And there doesn't seem to be an age where they stop, they stop developing. So people can still develop new ones at any age. Um, and, and that probably explains why, you know, people, um, you know, why people don't have uh, a lot of symptoms, have less symptoms of nosebleeds and GI bleeding, for example, in childhood and early adult life, but, but it's more of an issue later. Um, GI telangiectasia, same thing. They seem to develop um, at different, they can develop at any point in lifetime. Liver, we really don't know. Um, very, very, very rarely are children symptomatic with liver vascular malformations, but you heard Dr. Ratchin mention a couple of cases, which are, you know, you can count on one hand that cases reported in the world, but it may be that those liver vascular malformations are there in childhood and they're just growing slowly and they don't grow to a size that can cause trouble until, you know, someone's in their 50s or 60s. So that's, that's sort of what we know by organ, I would say. So there, I'm sorry that it's such a long answer. <laughs> Charlene or Scott, anything you wanna add? Anything I, I left out? I guess the only thing that comes to mind is um, uh, if you think about it, a, a period of growth would be pregnancy and the mm -hmm. special considerations that uh, we think of for women who become pregnant because there are a lot more hormones mm -hmm. that are um, promoting growth, uh, right. growth of the baby, of course, but that can spill over to changes in mom's body as well. And um, I missed the pregnancy uh, talk earlier, but did um, was that touched upon in the talk about how we need to monitor for AVMs during pregnancy? Yes, but I'm glad you highlighted it again, you know, so, and, and, and you're quite right. I, I, I mean, I completely agree with you that pregnancy is a time where lung AVMs are more likely to grow and where the monitoring and preventative management is really key. So thank you, great, great point, Charlene. Okay, excellent. Um, let's see, here's a question about uh, the bubble echo. Uh, what age should children receive a bubble echo test? <laughs> so it depends um, on where a child is being screened for lung AVMs, like at what center and what the expertise is there as to which specific test should be chosen. Um, and so 
But, but if you're asking at what age a child should be screened for lung AVMs, as soon as, as, soon as possible is the answer. So um, if this is a newborn, then screen them during infancy. If you just found out that you have HHT and you have a seven-year-old child, then screen them at seven years old. You know, so it's as soon as available, as soon as possible. There are different ways to screen kids for lung AVMs and they are, there's, um, it, they're, uh, there are several different approaches that are very much considered acceptable um, and were considered acceptable through in the HHT guidelines process. So it really depends on the center um, and what their protocol, their recommended protocol is. Okay, excellent. Um, so here's another comment. Um, so uh, I'm reading this. No one is following up with me. Should I be seeing someone every five years? So it's a question about how often you should be following up. Scott, you want to take that one? Yeah, I think it depends on you and your individual um, situation. I, I saw a question uh, earlier in the day asking if you see Gibbs generation. And, and as an autosomal dominant disease, it, it, you, you do pass on that gene um, uh, to, your, to your children. Uh, but the number of manifestations or how that disease affects someone is very different. And it kind of highlights just how different people can be. And so it's hard to make a clear, uh, for me at least, a clear recommendation of exactly what time interval you should be assessed. But I think the principle being that, you know, you should have ongoing HHC care in a way that addresses your specific situation and what manifestations they do have, whether they be lung or brain or otherwise, I think. Um, and so I think some of that is a, an individualized approach. Um, and so it would have to depend on uh, how often I think every five years or sooner sounds <laughs> sounds reasonable uh, or sooner. Mm -hmm. But again, it, it can depend a bit on um, um, your situation. And I'll just make sure my microphone is okay. Yeah, it was just Thanks. I, I totally agree, Scott. And I mean, we have some HHT patients that we see every month and we have others that we say, come back in five years, everything looks all good. So, but, but the person that we say, come back in five years, everything looks all good. If they have problems in one month or one year or two years, we want them to call us because we, we don't, we don't know. So that's a message sometimes that I, that I worry that doesn't get out there that we're certainly um, open to hear from our HHT patients anytime. We want them to consider us their resource for their HHT care. Um, and, but as a minimum, I would say every five years um, makes a lot of sense because that's typically when we're recommending rescreening for lung AVMs. And, um, and, and so the, the timing that, that works out is kind of a minimum rescreen timing for someone who's, who's had negative screening. Great, thank you. Um, so many doctors and nurses don't know too much about HHT. Uh, what, what are some suggestions on how we can educate um, medical professionals about HHT? I can take that. You want to take that? You go ahead, Charlene. Great. Excellent. That's such it's an, an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's such an excellent question. And, um, yeah. and I, I think um, it points to maybe a, a bigger issue on the physician side of things where those of us who work in these niche areas um, uh, need to be able to support our colleagues in uh, family medicine or primary care. So there's a couple of ways that we try to do this. So one, one way that we try to do it on the physician end is we try to provide some education to the family doctors and to the whole team of people that are involved in your care when we write our letters back to your, your family doctor. So we try to provide some education there. We certainly direct um, physicians to um, HHT websites. Um, so I'm referring physicians to the Cure HHT website, which has some good physician um, directed medical information and then um, uh, put in a link to the guidelines, the updated guidelines in my letter. And that provides a, a place for family physicians and other physicians to have a look. Um, and, and then things, other things that we do on our end is we provide uh, teaching sessions to our colleagues so that we educate um, other doctors about HHT and nurses about HHT. So um, in our terminology, we call that kind of meeting like this around. 
And so we provide rounds on HHT and those are just kind of seminars or um, workshops on HHT. That's how we provide some education. And then what you can do to provide education to your medical team is you can let everyone know that you have HHT. You can use um, a card or a written kind of um, uh, short form note of your HHT like the wallet card that Dr. Fonham had showed us earlier. That's excellent. Many smartphones now have um, a health app where you can put HHT as your diagnosis and you can put your specific um, organs that are involved in that link. There's um, a link on the American Cure HHT uh, website that has um, a health backpack, they call, call it. You can download it to your phone and uh, put your information in there. But most of the other phone manufacturers have a health kind of app where you can put your information. And then most importantly, what you can do, especially for those times when you cannot speak for yourself, is you can get a medical alert bracelet or a similar kind of medical alert bracelet and put HHT on there, as well as any other medical condition that you might have. And that is another way that you can educate the medical team, not just the doctors who know you, but any other doctor or nurse or paramedic who might not know you in case an accident happened, for example, so that they know that you have HHT. And that's probably universally the best way to communicate to all doctors about your underlying medical condition. So what you can do is um, on your end, just to answer your question is you can have a wallet card or a similar kind of information handy. You can pull out and show your doctors. You can have the backpack for health or other app or my health app on your phone to pull out and show your team. And then you can have a medical alert bracelet that tells everyone about your condition, particularly at times when you can't speak for yourself. I don't know if you guys have anything else to add to that. That was an amazing answer. <laughs> I think you covered it. I get that answer every day during HHT clinic. Well, fantastic answer. And, and also events like this where HHT Canada raises awareness. And That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, and I really agree with the medical alert bracelet. Um, what we try, what we tell, what we've tried to do though is have our patients have their medical alert bracelet say to look at the wallet card. Because the one thing I want to make sure of is that um, people don't just see uh, HHT as a warning, but they see it as they, that they understand that you have HHT and that they can still look after you. So, um, you know, sometimes when, if, like if you got a medical alert card that's, uh, you know, because I've had some patients do this over the years, it says HHT avoid anticoagulation. Like I disagree with that, you know, and I know that's not what you're suggesting, Charlene. Um, but, you know, I put think, I, I never say never to anything. Like, I think it's really important that people know that you have HHT, but then that they understand your disease and that they know what we've already figured out that you don't have lung AVMs, let's say, and that you don't, you know, maybe somebody has only mild nosebleeds and nothing else. And I'd really like that that to be known by the eMERGE doc who is considering giving an urgent blood thinner, for example. So I, I really like, and it doesn't have to be our HHT wallet card, but at some sort of little um, detailed information about, about your HHT to be connected to that uh, medical alert. And, that's, uh, and, and so speak to your HHT center about what that is that should be linked up to it. Great, thank you so much all of you. Um, so another question kind of follows on from that. Um, uh, how uh, you mentioned um, sending appointment at an HHT clinic? How can you get a referral to, for example, the Toronto HHT Center? Can you be self-referred, or do you need to see a physician beforehand? Yeah, let's each of us answer that. I think that's a really good question. So um, for at the Toronto HHT Center, um, we typically the the way the process typically works because the government wants us to to you know OHIP wants us to run it this way is that a referral comes from a family doctor or another physician that's part of your care. And they send a referral to us and say, please see Mr. So-and-so for HHT. And then we reach out and uh, we do a telephone interview with that person, our nurse does. And then, and then we make arrangements and do some education and we make arrangements for the first visit. Mm -hmm. However, some people have um, for sure have felt over the years that they could not get a referral or that they don't have a family doctor. 
Um, so we encourage those people to call us and we will help. Um, we will, first of all, we've never turned away someone that couldn't get a referral. And secondly, uh, you know, often we can help them sort of link up their, their clinicians with us um, quite easily. So, so you know, that, those are the two. So either ask for a referral to come and see us or just call us. Um, just call us and we'll help, you guide, we'll help guide you through the process. Can, I, can we add? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's really important. Um, one of the things that I hear from my patients um, here in Calgary and Southern Alberta where I practice is that sometimes uh, family doctors don't know what HHT is. It's a little bit hard to get a referral organized. And so I can only really speak for myself in my own practice. It sounds like Marie and I see Scott nodding his head, yes. Um, I take direct from patient referrals, and then we are actively doing um, case finding, which is a fancy way of saying that if I see a patient with HHT, I want to know all about their brothers and sisters and kids and aunts and uncles and grandparents and cousins and everyone, so we can find all those people with HHT and intervene and provide some education. So, um, it's not the usual way that referrals happen, but I think in terms of um, giving the best um, care and, and education for your patient community, uh, lots of us operate this way. And I'm, yeah, so we, we um, I primarily accept referrals from anyone really. I get about, I was through new referrals for HHT, about a quarter from medical genetics, I would say, um, maybe another quarter family physicians and about half from other specialists um, elsewhere, like like Dr. Javert, who was just speaking there, or others. Um, always happy to um, assist people through that process. And, uh, um, uh, but our clinic primarily is accepting through referrals from some physician, uh, any physician really, even um, out of province physicians. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, I, I echo what Dr. Fell is saying. I I, I, um, I I can't talk about specific situations, but we like I do really try to find means of getting family members of uh, HHT patients um, connected in some way, and and um, uh, including um, their children if the children are young and others, and and sometimes that is um, more challenging uh, situation. You've got someone in another part of the province uh, who's had a child and um, that individual may or may not have had genetic testing, the patient, I mean, not the child, and then trying to help those people navigate through that process. And so um, typically I recommend people see, get a referral to medical genetics unless they have symptoms. If, if happy to see anyone uh, who has symptoms. Um, but uh, trying to find means of navigating that process, popping the genetic results, giving it to the person so they can take it to their doctor or writing them letters or things like this to try and get um, family members uh, screened because it can be challenging as, as has been commented on many times before. Mm. I totally agree. And we also, I, I think our approach is similar to yours, Scott, that, you know, and I think all of us are very, um, um, are very intent on taking the family history and helping people get and helping fam get the message out to the family members um, that they need to be screened and and our approach is you know with let's you know when I'm seeing a given patient who has HHT is talking to them about their family reviewing their family history and trying to as you say help them navigate so oh where's your brother he's in LA okay here's the here's the information about the UCLA um, HHT center oh, your, your mother's in Montreal, okay, she can go to that, that HHT center. Um, so there's some of that that we discuss. And then also the idea that people, uh, I wanna echo the idea that people with symptoms should come to the HHT clinic and get checked because there's no, we don't wanna delay their screening for lung and brain AVMs while they go through genetics if, if they have symptoms. And if they don't have symptoms that we try to go the genetic route. And I think that we, like we start this process of counseling around the family and getting the family history um, from the first phone call that our nurse makes to the patient. That's when we start gathering that information. 
but it's an on it's sort of a living conversation and some some of our families you know 10 years later um family members are prepared to come for for screening and so it, it can be sometimes a very long uh, sort of lifelong <laughs> career long process those discussions but but i but i think it's um super important so you know i guess in, in a way i want to encourage my patients and and everyone's patients to ask us these questions again every time they come to the to our clinic, you know, because maybe there are new opportunities to help get their family sorted out or to help reach out to their family members. I often will provide, um, sometimes family members will say, well, I'm not actually in contact with my relatives, um, but they feel, um, you know, they, they wanna make sure their relatives know that they have HHT. So I'll, I'll draft up a letter with them that they can then take to their, or mail out to their, to their, um, their relatives. So I try to help, find those kinds of solutions too where when sometimes family relationships are complicated all right excellent uh, well, that was really helpful so there's a couple questions here with a similar type of um topic mm -hmm. firstly um are there any changes to hht during menopause if so and how and secondly is there a connection between angiogenesis and hormones like estrogen Two good questions. Um, Charlene, do you wanna do you wanna take a stab at it or do you want me to? Whatever you prefer. Oh. There are no easy answers on this one. <laughs> First I'll unmeet myself and then I'll take oh, a yeah. stab. <laughs> yeah. So um, I don't have a, a nice easy answer. Okay. Um, so we're talking about women, of course, because the question was around menopause. And in women, the sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone um, decrease um, around the time after menopause. And then around perimenopause, they can be all over the places some of you are aware of. And um, there is some pressure on angiogenesis from those hormones, which is why um, it's important to look at pregnancy as well. Um, I think it's a little unpredictable what happens in perimenopause, which is that time um, when a woman's periods are slowing down, um, but they're still happening. And then after menopause, um, what I'm hearing from my patients is that things actually settle down and seem to be easier after menopause. Although for um, a lot of women, epistaxis or the nosebleeds in particular don't ever really seem to change. And, and I, I think that maybe just has to do with epistaxis is a little bit different than the angiogenesis or the bleeding problems in other organ sites. I don't know if you wanted to add some scientific oomph behind that um, answer, either Scott or Marie. You know, I, I, I agree with everything you said, Charlene, and I think, you know, there was some evidence initially, and we have some bits of evidence to tell us that there's, a, you know, that there are some con connections of interest between estrogen and HHT related bleeding. Um, but it's, it's not, it's not a nice clear association with, you know, as people um, go into, you know, or put once, once a woman is postmenopausal that she can count on her nosebleeds getting better. I have had some patients who um, that's been the case. Um, I have not seen that consistently across our patients. And it's often the postmenopausal period for women where they can develop problems with HHT related GI bleeding or liver vascular malformations. So, so I'm really not sure what the right, what the answer is, honestly. And I think, and there have been, there have been no good natural his, history studies in that regard um, to help us, though hopefully we will gain some information from the HHT registry as we have more patients and longer follow-up because it's a prospective registry. And that's the kind of information that we are collecting. Um, one thing that you know, that kind of confounds the whole thing is that there's some evidence and, and, and you heard about this um, in some of the talks earlier today that you can treat HHT related bleeding with, horm with estrogen based hormones. So, you know, if you, um, if a woman is on the pill um, or on hormone replacement therapy, often her nosebleeds will be better. Um, and when she comes off of that therapy, often her nosebleeds will get worse, at least, maybe over the six to 12 months afterwards. So sometimes that, you know, that's influencing the whole relationship between menopause and nosebleeds and uh, menopause and other symptoms as well, is that there are many women that are on oral contraceptive and then later hormone replacement therapy over a period of sort of 30 years. 
So, um, so that, that's part of the equation too. And, and, and so there's no easy answer to this. There, is, there are some connections, but there's no, um, there, it, it, they seem to be multiple different connections and we haven't been able to clarify one particular uh, natural history path through menopause. That's the best I can answer that, I think. <laughs> Scott, do you have anything? Can you make it, can you make it clear? <laughs> no, no, I think I can't. Okay. It is, uh, does it, I, I focus more on the second part of the question, is does it have an effect? I think, yes, there, there must be some mm -hmm. uh, expression or change. And, and even from Dr. Javert's talk and some of the other co, uh, you know, case reports and studies of tamoxifen kind of also, mm -hmm. Now you've got a selective estrogen blocker that has some effect. And so, uh, you know, I think there is probably some complex interaction or effect, mm -hmm. but not verified any further than what uh, you're, you're, you're obvious. I, I think the, the major thing to understand, though, um, and not just for women, but also for men too with this disease is um, you kind of get to know your, you, you get to know your HHT as you live with it over time. You get to know the pattern of your nosebleeds. You get to know the pattern of your GI bleeds, if that's for you. Some people have a, a sense that maybe their pulmonary AVMs are starting to become like become problematic. So, you know, you really know your body. And if you find that things are changing over time, regardless of whether it's around menopause or, you know, moving from adolescence to adulthood, if things are changing in your body, it's time to check in with um, your HHT Good doctor, um, especially if things seem to be getting worse. So, you know, your blood counts are lower, you can't get your iron stores up, your nosebleeds seem to be having a different kind of pattern or you can't control them as well as you can. So we, even though we don't understand all of these uh -huh. complex interactions between the hormones and then the hormones that signal the hormones in the background, there's a lot of things that we don't yet understand. I think the, the point is that you know your body when things are changing. Um, I wouldn't just write it off and say, oh, it must be menopause. I would say, hmm, maybe I should give the HHT clinic a call because things are not quite as good as what they were or things are changing. And so thank you for that question because um, uh, it just reminds us again that um, when things change, not always to chalk it up to aging or menopause or what have you, but have a conversation with your specialist to make sure that there isn't anything that needs to be looked into. That's awesome advice, Charlene. I completely agree. Thank you for saying that. Amazing. That was really helpful as well. So here's a, here's a bit of an interesting question. Um, so I'm going to speak as the, uh, the, the person asking. I live in Brazil where there are no centers or doctors that treat HHT. It is very hard to find doctors that are interested in studies or treatments here in Brazil. What would be the possible reasons for this lack of interest surrounding HHT? Uh, I think Dr. Amin spoke a little earlier about this issue and how some physicians seem to almost avoid working with HHT. What do you think the reasons are for this? Is it due to the complexity of the disease or is it commercial causes? Uh, what are your thoughts? I'd be happy to try and answer this. Um, let me start from first thing though, for someone who lives in a country where there isn't HHT care, the best thing to do is to contact Cure HHT. Because even if there isn't an HHT center, Cure HHT has contacts in many countries all around the world of, uh, with physicians that have expressed an interest or have attended HHT conferences and who are, connect, who are willing to look after HHT patients and are connected with the international HHT group. So for starters, contact Cure HHT. Um, absolutely. Um, and they, they, they consider that one of their missions is to connect, collect, connect people up internationally with, with uh, physicians that will look after them. Um, second thing is why, um, I don't think it has, uh, uh, certainly there, it, I don't think there's any commercial bias or, or anything like that that's influencing this, influencing this, especially given that we really haven't had, it, it's not been a disease where we've had a lot of um, commercial influence or drugs to date. Um, so that I think that that's not a concern, but uh, not really a reason in here. But, but one of the things is, is that in order to um, provide HHT care, the way that we're talking about it at this conference, you need to have a certain infrastructure to your system. And some places, I'm, I'm not using, I'm not saying Brazil, but there are some places in the world where that infrastructure doesn't even exist. Like there isn't the structure to be able to 
um, do, you know, there aren't interventional radiologists or angio rooms where they can do pulmonary AVM embolizations, for example. So, so there are certainly issues in some countries and some parts of the world where the infrastructure doesn't exist. There isn't a healthcare system to support an HHT center. Um, but I think the biggest problem of all really is more about education and about, um, and about engaging clinicians in HHT care. So most of the HHT centers that exist um, in um, Canada and in the US and in Europe were started by individuals that became passionate about HHT care and built a team around them. And so, um, and so we're, you know, uh, and, and because it, it's kind of challenging to start an HHT center, um, even in places like our city, make our big cities in Canada, because, and in our big institutions in Canada, because HHT, like other rare disease, is, is very rarely listed as a top priority of a university or of a hospital. You know, it'll be like um, trauma will be the hot, you know, is one of the priorities at St. Mike's or, um, you know, cancer will be a priority at, 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 you know, at Princess Margaret Hospital, for example. But uh, individual uh, rare diseases amongst the 5,000 rare diseases are rarely listed as, an, as a priority of an institution. So University of Toronto or St. Michael's Hospital or any other hospital doesn't reach out and say, hey, we need an HHT center. Instead, it ends up being a, a doctor usually or a patient who come together and say, and, and, uh, and or who come together and say, hey, we need this to look after the people with HHT that, that are part of this community and it, it's built from the ground up. So, so this is unfortunately a very slow and ineffective way to spread things around the world. And we need, to, you know, there's a, there are a lot of places in the world where we don't have good HHT care, but it is one of the current, um, I can speak to the fact that it's one of the current um, development projects at Cure HHT to, um, with a new grant that they received to try and reach out to, um, to develop further international sites and further international expertise in countries where there is none. So there's a, there's a big initiative that's just beginning to come together in this regard under Cure HHT. So a very important problem. All right, um, I think we have enough time for one more question. Uh, I think there was one earlier about um, CPAP and how uh, people who have chronic obstructive um, sleep apnea might uh, have to, how, how that will play into HHT. Scott, do you want to answer that one? Sure. I think that one of the uh, concerns with CPAP in general um, in non-HHT patients is that there's a side effect associated with, with CPAP, including, um, sorry, some of the nasal side effects associated with CPAP, including uh, nasal dryness and and um, and nasal obstruction um, as a complication of CPAP use in, in anyone and and that can obviously be compounded in patients with HHT uh, whereby that dryness and lack of lubrication can predispose to, to further bleeding so um, I think like has been said many times about other um, situations, patients with HHT are entitled to all of the usual care that they would get, but some of the special considerations may be trying to find a way of ensuring good nasal lubrication, or if there's any humidification you can use with your CPAP or any other uh, means to try to prevent it from precipitating epistax or sort of nosebleeds, I should say. So I think that's the biggest um, concern or I guess um, complicating factor um, in patients who have uh, HHT and also require CPAP. Uh, and so I think part of it is working with your CPAP vendor, whoever you work with, because they might have some tips or tricks to ensure um, humidified air or, or to reduce nasal dryness, uh, because this is a problem that's encountered outside of HHT as well. Uh, but also maybe working with whoever manages your HHT related nosebleeds to try and find a solution that best works. Totally agree. <laughs> That's exactly our approach, Scott, too, in Toronto. Mm -hmm.